and through it? Yeah, mm. I've got uh, Christmas, and, uh, Christmas Eve off, and that's it. Just really? Just Saturday, so guys, Sunday. go ahead. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, sorry it was a little bit delayed here. Um, welcome, Gregor Robertson, the mayor of Vancouver. Uh, my name is Matt Robinson, Vancouver's son. I'm the uh, City Hall reporter, also for the province. Um, this is our Facebook Live uh, year-end interview. Thanks for coming. All right, good to be here. What we're going to do is we're going to take questions from people from you know, the public who mm -hmm. have chimed in. They've got some thoughts they want to put to you. Um, some questions. We're going to filter them out a little bit, find the ones that really uh, probably resonate with most people, and send them straight your way. Okay, um, sounds good. It's been a big year. Um, there was a lot of policy this year, uh, some new services. Um, you know, affordability has be become a massive issue in this city. We've got a very big budget um, that was just passed this week mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with some sizable property tax increases. Um, I think what we'll probably do is go first to a question about the budget. Okay. Some of these questions have been coming in through uh, the last 24 hours or so, so I've got a couple of them loaded up. Okay. And as you people uh, think of some things, send them our way, and I'll ask some some fresh questions that come in. So our first one is from uh, uh, Lee Clark. She wrote in to ask, "Why am I paying $800 a month in property taxes? This is insanity. Where do you think the average person gets all this money from?" Why is there not more responsibility to budgeting and spending? Well, well there's uh, a, a lot, lot of responsibility to budgeting and spending. spending. We've had, had uh, among, among the lowest tax increases uh, in the region, region and, and have, have some, some of the lowest property taxes, taxes in the country, country right now, or North, North America, America for that matter. So, so uh, property, property values have gone up, and, uh, uh, and that, uh, although it's, it's it's gauged so that doesn't crank up property tax directly, there's certainly been some impact with that. But, but city, city budgets have been very, very lean, and uh, we've, we've basically managed spending uh, in my eight years, years as, as mayor very carefully. And uh, we've, at the same time, prioritized spending on uh, housing this year, a lot of capital, $80 million, which is a, a new record for the city going into affordable housing. And uh, we have significant dollars going into child care, going into quality of life stuff here in Vancouver, which, which gets to affordability. Um, the only way that we can act proactively on it and get transit investments, get child care, get more affordable housing is, uh, is using uh, the, the government for that, that purpose. So I think we do a very responsible job of it. There, there's, not, um, there's not a lot to cut at City Hall unless you want to cut police or fire or you want to cut frontline workers, libraries. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all pretty essential services for a, a city and people, what they expect of quality of life in Vancouver. So. This year there was a 3.9% uh, property tax increase. Mm -hmm. Are we going to expect this sort of thing year after year after year in the future to get no, more services? No, I don't expect. You know, we've averaged around 2% for uh, almost every year that I've been mayor. Uh, cost of living increase, basically. And uh, this year we have a bunch of extraordinary costs. We have the fentanyl overdose uh, issue that's hitting um, people in Vancouver. So we've got our front. Uh, line workers, first responders like firefighters who are dealing with uh, a, and a really tragic situation on our streets and are really maxed out. They're running 24-7 at some of the fire halls. It's, it's relentless just saving lives. So we've got to give more resources to those people, uh, the first responders in particular, and, uh, and take care of the condition of the streets. We need, the streets need, need to be cleaned up better. We need to have uh, more support in the shelters, outreach workers. We just uh, the the conditions have gotten really tough, and that's uh, you know a, a broader challenge that we have as a city uh, with homelessness. And that we just we got to put more resources into solving these problems, and we got to keep pressure on the province and the federal government to invest more in housing, invest more in health care, so we don't have people falling through the cracks. Let's take you back to fentanyl. Mm -hmm. 0.5 percent of that property tax increase will go directly to battling the fentanyl crisis uh, in areas that fall under the city's responsibility. We had a question on, on, that, uh, on, that, on that exact topic. Why are you only taxing homeowners for the fentanyl crisis? Why aren't you advocating for funds to be put towards more mental health facilities? Oh, we absolutely are advocating. I, I mean, I've been really clear in, the, in calling for more treatment for mental health and severe addictions. And that, that's, it's a huge, huge problem. We haven't seen enough health care investment at a provincial and federal level into, uh, into mental health and addictions, and that's why we have a crisis in effect. 
And the trouble right now, there's a lot of resources going into frontline. We, you know, we're having to deal with it with uh, firefighters. Uh, ambulance service is maxed out right now. They need more resources from the province. That's just to deal with the chaos that's happening. We have to get to the next step, which is treatment, recovery. Uh, there has to be detox on demand. Uh, and the police chief and I have called for this. We're going to keep making a lot of noise about this because the, the provincial government needs to invest more in health care. The federal government needs to address this because it's a national issue right now. Uh, I, I fear for what's next if we don't get more investment in the health care side. You said the word crisis. It's the second time, I think, this year that you've talked about crisis, crises. Uh, the first time was with the uh, affordability crisis. Right. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of questions about affordability and what a budget increase like what, you're, what, what you've passed uh, will do for affordability. Now, one question here is from Tom Dobb. Moved away from Vancouver earlier this year because I thought I would never be able to afford a home there. Mm -hmm. Something that you've been worried about, I think. Yeah. Are you yeah. seeing people leave? Do you have any evidence of that? Well, some people are leaving. Uh, more people are coming. The, the city is growing. Uh, and that's you know largely, well, our economy is booming. Lots of jobs being created. We led the country uh, again uh, last year, this year, in economic growth and job growth. So we've got people coming here to work which is fantastic and, and lots of different industries that are, uh, are, are booming right now which is, which is great but it's created all this pressure on housing and uh, we have the record levels of housing that we're building especially rental housing but it doesn't work for everybody and, uh, and people are getting pushed out there's no doubt about that so that's, that's why it's a big focus that's why I call it a crisis because if, if, you, if you grow up here if you move here you have a job here but you can't stay because you can't find good housing, secure housing, affordable uh, and accessible housing, then, uh, then we got a problem. So that's a supply issue in part, and, and we have record levels that we're creating right now, but it's also a, a broader challenge. You know, we've got uh, across the region, uh, the, the whole region is kind of maxed out and, and growing, and it's an affordability issue right, you know, right out to the Fraser Valley now. It's not just a Vancouver problem. Let me take you back to the uh, budget again. We've got a clarifying question from somebody out there. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew Norden uh, asks, Gregor, how were you not able to find $3 million in saving, savings to fund the fentanyl crisis? The operating budget is $1.3 billion, and that's only 2% of that budget. Why weren't you able to cut a little bit of fat to find that $3 million? Now, I think it's actually $325 million, if, if I'm correct. Yeah. The, the fentanyl money that would come in. Why weren't you able to find that in the existing budget? Well, the budget gets built based on what people get paid, and most of the city budget is is basically wages, salaries for city employees, which are firefighters and librarians and uh, and police. Uh, you know, it's it's the people who run the city. So um, it's very difficult to find fat when most of the of the dollars go into those contracts, uh, which are all negotiated contracts, and uh, and it's tough. You know, we can't make cuts to that. Uh, we we uh, We've had, I think, good success in, in maintaining the services of the city without, uh, without growing significantly. Um, we are having to add more staff now uh, this year because we're, frankly, we're, we're taxed to the max. Uh, uh, workload is, is off the charts and uh, as with, particularly with our first responders and with our police, uh, the growth of the city is, is outpaced the growth of employees at the city. Anyway, it's just, it's not easy to find. Uh, at this point, we have we've have cut away at fat for the eight years that I've been in government and we have hit a point where you know what we've got to invest more we have got to make sure particularly when there's uh, their lives at risk we've got to uh, make sure we're investing more okay speaking of risk um, Kinder Morgan it's something that you've come out a lot about uh, you're, mm -hmm. you're strongly opposed I think it's fair to say to, yep. to the, the twinning of or the uh, doubling of the capacity tripling the capacity of the Trans Mountain Pipeline we've got a question from David Van Ruyen uh, how does Vancouver plan to deal? Oh, pardon me. How does Vancouver plan to deal with uh, a crude oil spill on the city's waterways with the proposed increase in tanker traffic? Yeah, that's well. That's one of the main reasons why I've been opposed to it is that uh, we Vancouver can't deal with an oil spill. We don't have the capacity to do that. We're not responsible for doing that. If it, if it happens, we obviously rely on the federal government, the Coast Guard. Uh, we rely on uh, the provincial government and uh, emergency services that they're responsible for. So when we've seen small oil spills it, here in the harbor, it's been a, a mess. And the response has been uh, pathetic. Historically, there's been 
no capacity to deal with a, an oil spill here, much less a, an oil tanker with diluted bitumen, which we don't even know how to manage. Uh, it has not, there isn't science to know what it's going to do when it hits the ocean, which is uh, one of the key arguments against that pipeline being approved, is the science hasn't been done uh, to, to demonstrate how we are going to deal with, uh, with this stuff if it's in the ocean here in Vancouver. Um, and that's, it's not a question of, uh, of if, it's when. when. If we're running seven times the number of oil tankers through the harbor here around Stanley Park, uh, there are going to be problems, there's going to be spillage, and uh, at this point, there's no capacity to deal with that. So, you know, we, we await what happens next. Uh, obviously, it's been approved by the federal government. Uh, they have also committed to significant marine uh, cleanup and safety uh, in investments. Uh, you know, we'll see where all that goes. We'll see where it goes with uh, what look like legal challenges from First Nations on the Kinder Morgan uh, approval. So uh, we'll see. You know, we're, we're taking, a, taking a step back to see what happens next with all of this, but obviously really concerned about potential both environmental and economic impact on Vancouver if this thing does go ahead. We've got a question uh, that came in. Uh, let me just find it here. Pardon me. On federal relations. Uh, Andrew Murray said, have you and JT made up yet? <laughs> I take that in the context of Kinder Morgan. Uh, how is your relation right now with the, the Prime Minister? How's your relationship? Uh, well, I, I, I understand he's on his way out here uh, soon again, but I, I haven't spoken to him since the decision. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a collegial relationship, uh, obviously, for, um, for years. Uh, but I, I haven't had a chance to talk to him since that decision. And, he, you know, I, he knows uh, that I was strongly opposed to it and uh, the reasons why. Um, and I, you know, I think they've got work to do to, to demonstrate uh, the rationale and, and that somehow this is going to be safe uh, for the West Coast here, which, um, you know, it, it, we've seen problems with, uh, with oil ports and oil fossil fuel infrastructure. Wherever it happens, it's not... Uh, it's not the cleanest of industries, uh, and that, that definitely is at odds with Vancouver's uh, Vancouver's economy, Vancouver's environment, and uh, you know we'll, we'll have to be very vigilant about what the next steps are and, and make sure that uh, we minimize or, uh, or eliminate the uh, impacts on the city. Okay, so so again, um, in terms of your relationship with the prime minister, will you do you feel like that decision will have had a, a lasting effect on the? Ability to work collegially. With no, him. no. We, I mean, we got to work together. It's no, you know, he's the prime minister, and uh, you know, ninety per, half of our tax dollars go to Ottawa, and uh, we've got an important partnership there that we've got to maintain. We've got to improve based on uh, this last uh, decision. It's it's more challenging, obviously, um, because of the decision that they make that that puts us in a difficult situation. But I, I think. Uh, there's other big, you know, transit, housing, they're really important partnerships uh, where we got to get along, we got to get things done for the people who live here. Let's switch gears a little bit to the provincial government. Um, there's some breaking news today. Um, hopefully you followed mm -hmm. this. What are your thoughts on the BC government offering uh, down payment loans to first time home buyers? It's a maximum of $37,500. Is that enough? What do you think about the idea? Uh, well, I think it's a positive to have any investment in housing uh, a, an affordability for people who are looking at uh, first-time purchase of a home. Uh, there's, uh, there's now an opportunity, I think, for a whole bunch of people to be able to buy into the market when they were not able to do that uh, in recent years. Uh, so, uh, you know, it should be a positive. It should be a way for, um, for more people to get secure housing, uh, move from the rental market into uh, owning a place and uh, maybe that eases the pressure on the rental market in the process so I, I think it's I think it's a positive and uh, it's one of many different steps that we need to deal with fa the affordable housing in particular okay again switching gears uh, no pun intended this time at all um, bike lanes um, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of questions about bike lanes included in the budget was 17.4 million dollars for bike lanes and greenways mm -hmm. um, so we've got a question from uh, Romeo Del Pinto. Why have you decided to destroy Little Italy with a bike lane, an area where restaurants and shops already suffer from the least amount of parking in Vancouver? That's interesting because uh, there's no decision yet on, uh, on Little Italy commercial drive. There's a, there's a proposal that we do what's called a complete street, which is widening the sidewalks 
adding bike lanes and not losing any parking. That's, that's the principle we would approach this is we don't want to lose parking uh, on a commercial drive because it's a huge destination for people. Uh, a lot of people that shop on the drive walk or bike uh, to do that and, uh, and so there's a need to improve those options and uh, right now there's four lanes for cars. It's, it's more of an arterial but the drive has turned into more of a shopping street. It's, you know, people come from all over the region to shop on the drive. So I think there's a case to be made that we don't need four lanes of traffic. Two lanes of traffic will work and we can have wider sidewalks. We can have more cafes and tables and more action on the sidewalks and, and have it safer for bikes as well. So that's the, um, the proposal and it's out with the community right now to see what do you think. Uh, some, some merchants uh, are already opposed, I think because they think that parking's gonna be lost, which is not the case, that we wouldn't do it if we were gonna, we wouldn't do this if it was gonna be a negative for the, for the street and uh, the people who live there and, and do business there. We've got a sort of a follow-up question from Cassidy Burns and, uh, and that's, what is up with your war on the car? I think a lot of people feel like maybe what some of the things you said uh, making rooms for room for pedestrians, making room for bikes, uh, making for a complete street. Yeah, might take space from cars. Well, I, I take issue with that. I mean, if we were to say, okay, we're going to add another, I don't know, ten, twenty, fifty thousand cars to the streets of Vancouver, that would be war on cars. You you want more cars? Do you want more traffic? You want to move slower in your cars? The whole purpose of getting people walking, biking, and taking transit is to reduce the amount of cars on the road. And, and that's what that is happening. The numbers, the numbers of cars is, are going down slightly while the population grows. So it, it's just, it's simple logic. We, the only way we get more people moving around the city is to use other forms of transportation. And the more people do that, the less traffic for cars. So uh, we've taken very little real estate away from cars uh, in the city. There's still lots of parking. There's still you know, lots of travel lanes. Uh, it, it's been very careful and strategic. Uh, to make sure that people can use, can walk, you know, we built sidewalks for a reason too, so that people could walk safely uh, uh, in the roadways, and uh, that's the same with bikes. They, uh, they roll at a different speed, they don't mix with pedestrians or cars very well, so those, you have to have those three forms uh, enabled and safe, and, uh, and that's the way you can get people picking and choosing what, what works for them, and less cars ultimately uh, making traffic in the city. Okay, we've got uh, one more question, and then we're done. You've, uh, you've been on, this is your third term now. Yep. Um, there's been a lot of rumors about you moving on to different uh, areas of government, potentially moving over to the federal liberals. There's been a lot of rumors about that. Uh, more lately, it hasn't been about the liberals. It's been about moving over to the federal NDP. Any no. truth to any of these rumors? No. What, are you, what is your next step after this? Will no. you return as a, as a fourth term mayor? Will you run again? Well, that's my plan is, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with my, my job being the mayor of Vancouver. And uh, I, the rumors have been around since I first got into politics. It's like there's always speculation about where people go next, uh, or it's like hockey players getting traded. I, 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 don't, I don't have any plans to go anywhere else, but I, I love being the mayor of Vancouver and lucky to have the job, and uh, hopefully I, I get to keep it another term. All right, well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you very much for coming, Mayor. Thanks, Matt. And uh, take care.